seated. So when I was 20 or 21 years old with a full head of hair, I went on a uh, mission trip. I led a team to go onto a Native American reservation in Arizona uh, to do some building and, 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 and repair work and get to know the, the community. And one of the things that struck me was the disconnect between generations. The children and teens wanted more than anything to have opportunities that transcended the reservation. They wanted to leave. They wanted to go to college. They wanted to see what the world was like outside of the reservation. And despite the fact that there might be incredible gains from doing that, their parents and grandparents thwarted that at every turn. So much so that there seemed to be a box around the place where uh, the children would find themselves uh, getting into trouble, uh, the prisons were full, and the children would say, there's nothing outside of this for me. I can't leave. So what point is there? What purpose is there in making other decisions? And you realize in the moment how interconnected land and progeny are. If you don't have children to leave your land to, what is the value of your land? What's your identity? What's your legacy? It was heartbreaking to see that disconnect and uh, it's a much lesser degree, but uh, about five years later, as I'm serving in Catlett, uh, which at the time had, had even more working farms than it does now, uh, I realized a heartbreak when generations saw the generations beneath them uh, not wanting to, to, to keep the farm going for another generation, uh, wanting to go into the Beltway to see what opportunities might exist there uh, and, and how much of their family's story was lost. In the, uh, even though there was opportunity to sell the land, uh, as Northern Virginia expanded, it came with a consequence, and it came with a loss of identity, uh, and it came with a loss of family story. Uh, and this only gives us a glimpse of what Abraham is dealing with. Abraham, having ample uh, uh, cattle from, uh, from the gift from the Pharaoh, which I'll go back to, uh, has, has the promise of land, which hasn't been granted, uh, and has all of these cattle and whatnot, but the land is worthless if he doesn't have the progeny to take care of it. And our life at that point in time is about what legacy uh, we can pass forward. And so Abraham, despite God's coming to him, and despite his deep desire to be faithful to God, to follow God, is still somewhat encumbered both by the culture and by his desire for security and his desire for the things that he thinks gives his life value. Land and progeny. And we see his fear as, he, um, as, as he's faithful to God, but he goes to, uh, to Egypt, and, he, and he, as he goes, he realizes his beautiful wife uh, will be much coveted, and he says to Sarah, uh, do you mind if we pretend to be brother and sister? Because if we're husband and wife, they'll just knock off the husband and, and take the wife for themselves. Uh, but if we're brother and sister, I have a chance of making it. Uh, and so they do that. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, uh, God challenges him to, to, to deepen his faith. Uh, and Abraham responds, but, but I have no progeny. I have, you know, I, I have no land. Where, where is the fulfillment of this promise? Where are the things that give me security, that give me a sense that my life will continue beyond itself? And so we have that first covenant with God, where God says, your ancestors will outnumber the stars, but that first covenant, where they burn the sacrifices. And the tradition was that uh, the two covenant partners uh, would walk hand in hand through the fire, uh, through the fires of, 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 of the burnt offering, uh, in a sign of solidarity that both people are committed, both people are taking risk. Uh, but what we see in today's gospel, that God is the only one taking risk. Uh, that God walks through for both of them, realizing that Abraham's not there yet. And we'll see in a couple chapters that Abraham uh, eventually uh, has to pony up and, and, and be part of that commitment. Uh, but it begs the question, as we are on our Lenten journey, as we are trying to get to a place that's different than where we stand right now, what needs to come off? What is pulling at us, keeping us from letting go? Two weeks ago, before we started uh, this journey, as we stood on the mountaintop, I talked about uh, a book I had read, uh, Boys in the Boat, and Joe Rance, and uh, that he had every physical gift needed. And he had every a bit of discipline and hard work and every component to be a great oarsman except he kept falling short, and he kept keeping the team from being what they could be, uh, and his journey, the thing that held him back was that he couldn't trust. He couldn't surrender himself and trust fully those boys in the boat, his partners. 
because of his abandonment, because his, his, his father had left, because his mother had died, uh, and, and he had to realize that in order for him to be able to be a full participant, to be the full person that God made him to be, to be able to be fully in the boat, he needed to trust. But we're that boat, and each one of us has a deep desire to be the fully person that God has made us to be, to fully follow Christ, to fully point ourselves toward Jerusalem and where God is calling us on a mission, uh, but something holds us back, and we as the boat have to help shape one another towards the cross, towards the God who made us in God's image for God's purposes. And how do we do that? Jesus is struggling with the same thing. Jesus is pointing towards Jerusalem. He's begun his walk towards Jerusalem. And uh, today's gospel uh, has some of the Pharisees. And realize that the Pharisees uh, come in several, uh, several examples. Some of them uh, where they're antagonizing or, uh, uh, or pressing Jesus. Some where they're curious, like Nicodemus. And some where they're actually helping Jesus. So, uh, so we get a breadth of what the Pharisees are. Uh, but they come to Jesus and they warn him that Herod wants him. And he calls Herod a fox. Jesus is all-powerful, and it's his metaphor. Jesus could be a velociraptor if he wanted to be. He could be Tyrannosaurus Rex. He could be a lion or a tiger. And what does Jesus say he is in this metaphor? He's a hen. Name an animal more vulnerable to a fox than a hen whose deepest desire, whose deepest desire in the whole world is to put all of those vulnerable chicks under his wing. To be like a hen. Sort of the opposite of what people might expect. Sort of the opposite of what we would like if we were on a journey towards Herod, towards the cross, towards Jerusalem. The opposite of what we'd like. We'd like the security and the power uh, and even given our anger and our, uh, our disillusionment, we'd want all the weapons in our capacity. But Jesus goes as a hen to battle a fox. Our third grade, as I went in and talked to them, uh, they'd just seen the, the, the story uh, of, 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 the, of Luke's gospel. And one of the questions that came up is, uh, why was Judas so willing uh, to hand Jesus over? Why did Judas betray Jesus? And I think the answer is somewhat uh, similar to John's uh, dis, uh, dis in, in, in enlightenment with, with Jesus, is that uh, Jesus didn't come in the form that people wanted. People wanted John Wayne. They wanted... Jesus on a big white horse to go into Jerusalem to tear down all that had been uh, soiled about the church, to tear down all that Roman uh, uh, occupation had taken from them, to return their land. They wanted somebody with sharp teeth uh, that could destroy a fox. And when Jesus came with a message of love and compassion, that power isn't exactly the way that we, uh, that we attribute power, things got turned upside down. People were confused, and they were lost. Now, I'm going to read the rest of my sermon. You can dock my wages for stealing from somebody else, but I realized I was going to paraphrase it anyway. Uh, but Barbara Brown Taylor is an incredible writer, uh, and she finishes my sermon better than I could, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, but she talks about this, our expectations being turned upside down. Maybe some of you saw the Clint Eastwood movie called Pale Rider that came out several years ago. Clergy in the Atlanta area were sent invitations to a special preview, so I went, wondering what in the world this movie had to do with the church. As it turned out, Clint played a frontier preacher with a past. What kind of past was never clear. But he walked around in a clerical collar looking deeply pained. And once when he took off his shirt, you could see the scars of three old bullet holes in his back. One day he rode into a mining town that had been overrun by foxes. The corrupt sheriff was in cahoots with a bunch of armed bullies who were always taking things that did not belong to them and then killing anyone who got in the way. At first, Clint just took it all in, getting clear who the foxes were and where their lair was. Then one day he calmly walked into the bank and produced the key to a safe deposit box, a clue to his past in that very same town. Alone in the vault, he pulled the box from the wall and opened the lid. Inside was a pair of six shooters and a belt full of bullets. Clint carefully took it out and strapped it around his waist, and then he took off his clerical collar and put it in the box while all the clergy in the audience went wild. Yes, go get him, Clint. <laughs> 
gun down those foxes and nail their tail to the wall, which is exactly what he did, to the great satisfaction of everyone in the theater, including me. That was Clint Eastwood. But Jesus is Jesus. He too bore old scars on his body. He too meant to protect the chicks from the foxes, but he would not become a fox himself in order to do it. He refused to fight fire with fire. When Herod and his bullies came after Jesus and his brood, he did not produce any six shooters to stop them in their tracks. He just put himself between them and the chicks, all fluffed up and hunkered down like a mother hen. It may have looked like a minor skirmish to those who were there, but that contest between the chicken and the fox turned out to be the cosmic battle of all time in which the power of tooth and fang was put up against the power of a mother's love for her chicks. And God bet the farm on the hen. Depending on whom you believe, she won. It did not look that way at first, with feathers all over the place and chicks running for cover. But as time went on, it became clear that she had done it became clear what she had done. She had refused to run from the foxes, and she had refused to become one of them, having loved her own who were in the world. She loved them to the end. She died a mother hen, and afterwards she came back to them with teeth marks on her body to make sure they got the point, that the power of foxes could not kill her love for them, nor could it steal them away from her. They might have to go through what she went through in order to get past the foxes, but she would be waiting for them on the other side with love stronger than death. I've never really thought about the church as a mother hen, but I am thinking about it now. The Church of Christ as a big, fluffed up, brooding hen, offering warmth and shelter to all kinds of chicks, including orphans, runts, and maybe even a couple of ducks. This Church of Christ planting herself between the foxes of this world and the fragile bone chicks, offering herself up to be eaten before she will sacrifice one of her brood. The Church of Christ staying true to whose body she is by refusing to run from the foxes and refusing to become one of them. Who would have thought being a mother hen offered such opportunities for courage? Maybe that's why the church is called Mother Church. It is where we come to be fed and sheltered. But it is also where we come to stand firm with those who need the same things from us. It is where we go grow from chicks to chickens by giving what we have received, by teaching what we have learned, and by loving the way we ourselves have been loved by a mother hen who would give his life to gather us under his wings. Amen.